saying that uh, we understand how 19A and 19B work, the compulsory joinder rules. And so let's go back to our problem and see what happened in our case. In uh, our problem, we now begin at line, um, our conclusion at line 19, by the way, was that the court should have dismissed this complaint because clearly there's no diversity here, but they should have left the original complaint in place, uh, even though Big Corp is complaining about it, because Big Corp is saying you should have joined Amcorp, and Paul cannot join Amcorp, but Big Corp can and plead them, and that's what Big Corp should have done. Line uh, 21. Paul then filed a suit against Big Corp and Amcorp in State B. Well, let's see. So the third thing that happened over here uh, is that Paul filed a suit in state court in state B. So the third thing that happened here is we have a suit Paul versus both of them, Big Corp and Amcorp in state court. This is in State B court. State court in, uh, in State B. I, I say this funny, what I'm really trying to say here, because I better get it right. They filed in State court. And so they filed in state court in state B, and this uh, Amcorp here, this is Amcorp, Amcorp filed a motion to quash service, uh, so Amcorp filed a motion to quash service of someone contesting personal jurisdiction. So Amcorp right here says uh, to uh, state B, So Amcorp is saying no personal jurisdiction. They claim no personal jurisdiction. So let's take a look at that. The State B Court Line 23 the State B Court determined that it lacked personal jurisdiction over Amcorp and dismissed it from the action. So the State Court here says we don't have personal jurisdiction over Amcorp. Well, were we asked about that? And the answer is uh, yes, item two. The second call of the question is, was this correct? So we'll have to go through a personal jurisdiction analysis here to decide whether or not state court had personal, the state court in state B, did it have personal jurisdiction over M court? And so let's see. Uh, let's take a look at that. We're going to erase this board so we can, well, I'll just, I'll just not erase the board, I'll just use another board. So, personal jurisdiction, what are the requirements? So, personal jurisdiction requires a basis. Remember that these basis really means contact. And the tradition, the basis can be the uh, traditional basis. And the traditional base present when served and the third one is consent. 
Now, in our case, uh, uh, MCORP, is MCORP domiciled in state B? And the answer to this basis part is no. They're not domiciled there. But don't forget, this is the place where you have to talk about the two places of domicile of the corporation. And if that is place of incorporation and principal place of business. You point out that the place of incorporation you're told is state A, and this is personal jurisdiction over Amcorp we're talking about here, personal jurisdiction over And so, Amcorp is not domiciled in state uh, B, and state B is not its principal place of business. The reason we know it's not its principal place of business is because there are two ways to determine the principal place of business. Some, uh, uh, the uh, place of uh, where the headquarters are and the place where the main manufacturing facility is so-called nerve test and muscle test. And we have enough facts now so that under either test, Amcorp is not domiciled in state A. So the answer to this is no. President, when served, the answer to this is no. Consent, the answer to this is no. So uh, the conclusion is that uh, we cannot get jurisdiction over that we don't have so the old uh, historical basis, traditional basis uh, will not work let's finish this out you need a basis, you need a long arm statute and notice and so the traditional basis won't work and so we try the modern basis And the modern base, as you recall, there are two of these. One is systematic and continuous activities in the state. And the other one is the so-called minimum contact doctrine. Systematic and continuous activities in the state. Uh, the, does Amcorp have systematic and continuous activities in state B? And here, this you need to discuss. You need to discuss it because, after all, we do know that Amcorp does sell. We know from over here in the previous, on the previous board, we know that uh, Amcorp does do this two times a year. And is that, and their stuff ends up here in the state B being sold. Is that enough for systematic and continuous activities in the state? The answer is probably not. It's probably not enough. It's, uh, normally, if AMCORP has systematic and continuous activities in state B, that means that AMCORP has facilities or personnel who are regularly or almost consistently or systematically in state B, but simply sending its products there twice a year is probably not systematic and continuous activity in the state. Um, so, but you need to discuss that. So you need to discuss this, and then the minimum contact uh, does M uh, AMCORP have minimum contact with state B? Does AMCORP have minimum contact with state B? And you recall the requirements here are purposeful availment, nexus, foreseeability, and fair. You should discuss each of these fully. The first of them, purposeful availment. Did AMCORP purposely avail itself 
of the benefits of state B. Did AMCORP purposely avail itself of the benefits of state B? Well, yes, because AMCORP is selling its product in state B, not an isolated event, but at least twice a year they send all their surplus over to state B. And so they're getting money back out of state B, and that is purposely availing itself of the benefits of state B when state B is a part of the market where you sell your stuff. So make that argument for purpose of ailment. Nexus, did the cause of action arise out of this purpose of ailment? Well, sure. The saw that injured Paul uh, came through this, uh, it was uh, Amcor manufactured, and they sent it over to state B where it got sold, and they got money back from that. So yes, the cause of action did arise out of the purpose of ailment. Foreseeability. Is it foreseeable by a person in the defendant's position, that's in AMCOR's position, is it foreseeable by a person in AMCOR's position that if they uh, uh, engage in this kind of activity, they may have to go to state B and defend? And uh, make your argument, I think it's foreseeable, particularly when you, you point out that uh, the AMCOR is not only just selling stuff in state B, they sell apparently all their surplus twice a year. They apparently have quite a bit of surplus. They're a big company. So they have a lot of stuff going on. That's a reason to foresee they may have to defend there. A second reason to foresee that Amcorp may have to defend there is that the item they sent over there, the saw, is a dangerous item. You send dynamite to some state and I don't care, you send only one stick and you may have to go there and defend. Whereas you send a cone to one state and it's exceedingly unlikely you'd have to go there and defend, even if the cone broke and injured somebody. <coughs> so the nature of the item that's being sent is more dangerous, that makes it more foreseeable. They may have to go there and defend. So give an argument on foreseeability. And then finally comes fairness. Is it fair? Remember, for fairness, you look at the location of evidence, location of witnesses, convenience of the parties, and the state's interest. Location of evidence, location of witnesses, location of a convenience of the parties, and the state's interest. Well, this is an ordinary law, so the state's interest is just ordinary, uh, so there's nothing special there like it's an insurance company or something. The uh, location of witnesses and evidence, well, a lot of that, the location of witnesses to the injury are going to be in state B. The, uh, uh, the saw itself, of course, can be easily moved around. The um, convenience of the parties, uh, it's not that incon... Well, Paul sued in state B, so it's not the convenience of Paul, it's the convenience of, of Amcorp that we're more concerned about. But if Amcorp is a big corporation and they're sending their, their, their surplus over to state B twice a year and they manufacture saws, so they're not a little outfit, they can defend themselves in state, in state B. And so I'll give good discussions about these and you get points. You just list the words and you don't get much. But give it a, a meaningful discussion about these. And I think you've satisfied the minimum contact uh, requirements. So that's an adequate basis, a modern adequate basis for jurisdiction. Now that we have an adequate enough contacts between AMCORP and uh, State B, now that we have enough contacts, then uh, we, we need a long arm statute. And so we look at the problem and see that we have a long arm statute. Um, and uh, the answer is we're not given the long arm statute, but so you volunteer right here that every state has a long arm statute. So make your point here, all states have long arm statute. Statute and all states. All states have long-arm statutes, and no matter which type it is, 
this would be sufficient whether it's a list type or a law coextensive with the U.S. Constitution uh, would work in this case. And notice, well, apparently uh, AMCORP got the notice because they made a motion to quash. So they made a motion to quash the summons and service. This, by the way, this motion to quash almost sounds like slang or something. But this is the formally correct label for what you put on the, what you do when you claim that the, the, first, the court does not have personal jurisdiction, motion to quash. So, uh, we think that the court had jurisdiction over AMCORP, and if we now go to, uh, <coughs> to, uh, um, line 23, it says the state B court dismissed, uh, uh AMCORP from the action. So, going back to our problem, Paul right here sued Big Corp and Amcorp, and according to the facts, then the court dismissed Amcorp from the action, leaving Big Corp still in the action. So Amcorp is out, Big Corp is in. Continuing at line 24, Paul voluntarily dismissed his action against Big Corp without prejudice. So Paul versus Big Corp is still left in the suit. And this part is still there. And the, uh, so Paul now voluntarily dismissed. And that's a voluntary dismissal without prejudice. And, uh, when you dismiss without prejudice, you can bring the suit again. If you then dismiss with prejudice, you cannot bring the suit again. So as you kind of applies, and you cannot bring the suit again if you dismiss with prejudice. And so now, Paul has dismissed the suit this suit here of uh, so the suit that's left is this one and uh, the suit that's left is this one and Paul dismissed this uh, without prejudice line 26 Paul then brought the product liability suit in state A. Okay, so the fourth thing that happened is we're over here now in state A. So Paul brought the product liability suit in state A, naming M Corp and B Corp as defendants. So over here we have Paul versus, again, B Corp and M Corp. Big Corp, now this is Big Corp here. Big Corp moved to dismiss Big Corp from the action on the grounds of res judicata. And that doesn't apply here because Paul had sued Big Corp but voluntarily dismissed without prejudice. And so all of his rights are preserved and Paul can later sue Big Corp and he did it here in state A. And that's how you would analyze this problem. Uh, just and, and we've in going through the problem, we've discussed the analysis of each of the issues. This brings us to the uh, second problem that we want to do. So you understand, I think, as a result of this discussion, how uh, Rule 19A and 19B work. And what I want to do next is to move on to our next uh, subtopic for today. And that is res judicata and collateral estoppel. And for those purposes, we're going to the problem from February 94, the res judicata and collateral estoppel problem from February 94. Uh, let's take a look at that problem.
February 94 problem uh, reads as follows. This is Paul, Danko, and Owen, and the problem reads as follows. Paul sued Danko in federal court for $100,000. So Paul sued Danco in federal court for 100000 Now, if Paul is suing Danco in federal court, the thing you should think here about is, is there a federal question here, or is this diversity? If it's diversity, the amount of, of the uh, amount in dispute is large enough, $100,000, but we need to keep an eye out for the domicile of the parties. So Paul sued Danco in federal court for 100000 He alleged that Blackacre had been damaged by Danco's negligent use of explosives. Interesting. So let's see here. Uh, so Danco is doing some explosives over here. So let's say this is where this is happening. And these are explosions. And uh, over here, uh, here is Blackacre. So uh, this is where Dan goes doing the exploding. Black Acre. So we have a lawsuit. Uh, first lawsuit here is Paul versus Danko for one hundred thousand dollars, and we don't know uh, in Paul versus Danko for the hundred thousand. We don't know if this, this has to be a. <coughs> A suit based on diversity, I guess, but they aren't. We don't know that yet. Line eight. In addition, Paul sought an injunction to prohibit future blasting and timely requested a jury trial. So let's see here. Right here, then, what we know is that he wants 100,000 in damages. He wants an injunction. And he wants a jury file. The uh, the request for jury trial was denied. Um, well, you, if you if you're suing in federal court, and these people are in federal court, the Seventh Amendment says that if you're suing in federal court for $20 or more, you get a jury. Now, you don't get juries on injunctive issues because those are equity uh, cases and uh, you don't get juries in equity cases. But uh, as to the the damages, there, so you should get a jury. So you, what it comes down to is entitled to a jury on this and this is no jury. And uh, these two, and so let's see what happens. The request for jury trial was denied altogether. He's entitled to a jury trial on the issue of damages here. Second paragraph, line 10. Danco denied that Blackacre was damaged. Oh, but by the way, <clears throat> one of the things we're going to be asked at line 31 is did the court error in denying Paul's request for a jury trial? And we can answer that question right now, that the court should have granted a jury trial on the damages and should not have granted a jury trial on the uh, injunction. So the, uh, the issue to the answer to the question is that here he's entitled to the jury, right to the jury here, and here he has no right to the jury. And so the answer to the first part of the question is that he should uh, have not been denied a jury trial on the issue of damages. 
It also should point out, just to get more points out of this, that the general rule in federal court is that since people are entitled to a jury trial in federal court, since they're entitled to jury trial, that uh, they should, uh, uh, if you have uh, equitable and legal issues which are both being, which are both involved in the dispute, that the court, in order to, that the court should make every effort to try to give people a a jury trial on the legal issues. And it's okay to not have jury on the equity issues. And that's because the Seventh Amendment says you're entitled to jury trial. And just because you got equity issues there, you don't want to take away the person's right to a jury trial on the legal issues of damages. And so if both of them are involved in the case, in the federal courts, what they do is to try to always do the uh, legal issues first. So you get a jury trial on the facts involved in the legal issue, and then uh, the injunction or equitable issues afterwards. Because otherwise, if the judge has to make some decisions about facts in order to decide what to do about the injunction, if the judge has to make some decisions about the facts, then the jury is going to be bound by those decisions and you don't get a jury trial on the factual issues that the judge had to decide in order to give you the injunction or deny the injunction. And so uh, we, in the federal court, you try to do the law issues first and equity issues second. In the California state courts, the Seventh Amendment, the right to a jury trial in these civil cases, is not applicable to the states through the due process clause of the 14th. So the states don't have to follow that same procedure, and in fact, California doesn't. The California uh, rule, the courts will do the equity issues first, and then the jury issue on whatever is left over, because we don't have that fourth, Seventh Amendment sort of forcing us to do it. Now, there is a provision in the California Constitution that gives a person a right to a jury trial in civil cases. But uh, the way that for a minute works, it doesn't prevent the court from doing the equity issues uh, first, even though the judge has to make some decisions on facts. So uh, that's everything that you could have said about the first call to the question. Continuing now, we're now at line 10, and we've answered the first call of the question. Line 10 says, Danco denied that Blackacre was damaged at all. Okay, so Danco says Blackacre wasn't even damaged. Uh, and claimed that Paul, who asserted ownership of Blackacre by adverse possession, was not the owner. And so Danco claims here, Danco right here is claiming two things, claiming that Blackacre is not, was not damaged, and also claiming that Paul is not the owner. So these are the two claims by Danco. We are continuing now at line 11. At line 11, the court said, uh, the court heard extensive evidence and concluded that because Paul had no interest in Blackacre, so the court says, Paul, you don't own it. So the court agreed right here. Paul does not own Blackacre. The court says, because Paul had, was not the owner of Blackacre and because Blackacre had not been damaged. So the court agreed with this also. So the court agreed and also the court said Blackacre wasn't damaged. So the court agreed here also.
So the court agreed on both of those. So the court said, because Black Acre wasn't damaged, and because it wasn't damaged, and because Paul was not the owner, uh, the uh, Paul could not recover. So Paul loses because of those two reasons. Now we've got a little problem here because the court said uh, that later on what's going to happen is that um, the real owner of Black Acre is going to is going to show up. Okay, the real owner of Black Acre is a person named Owen. So when Owen shows up and says, I'm the real owner of Black Acre, and I, Owen, want to sue Danko for the damage to Black Acre. So later on, we're going to have a suit. Let's put it in here. Later on, we're going to have a suit right here of Owen versus Danko. This suit here. Sorry, that's so small. I hope you can focus in on that. So this suit, Owen versus Danko, is coming up before long. And when it comes up, Owen versus Danko, Owen sues Danko, and Danko is going to say, hey, the court has already decided that Black Acre was not damaged. And if the court has already decided Black Acre was not damaged, then Owen, you lose. So Danko is going to try to apply either collateral estoppel or res judicata against Owen, saying the court's already decided that. And so we need to look at the rules for collateral estoppel and res judicata and see what's going to happen when Danko says to Owen, you can't recover because the court has already decided Black Acre was not damaged. So let's look at the rules for res judicata and collateral estoppel. Now, let's put these on the board here. First of all, let's talk about the rules for res judicata. Uh, in res judicata, the federal rules, FRCP, res judicata applies to a transaction. A transaction or occurrence. applies to the entire transaction occurrence. And secondly, under the California rules, primary, we are a primary rights state. And there are four primary rights. They are against personal injury, personal property, uh, real property, and personality. And when I say personality, I mean uh, things like defamation, invasion of privacy, those kinds of torts. Now, let's talk about these distinctions for a moment because they are quite important. First of all, under the federal system, if two people have a car accident uh, and uh, one of them sues the other, the lawsuit is viewed as a suit regarding the entire transaction or occurrence. Okay? The lawsuit is not just about 
of the property damage or just about personal injury. It's about, the, or just because at the scene of the accident, one of the people called, the other one has some dirty names or something. The, uh, 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 the lawsuit is about the entire transaction or occurrence. This means that every possible lawsuit which could have been brought out of that car accident must be brought in one lawsuit. All claims, all counterclaims, doesn't matter the nature of the claim, whether it's about personal injury or harm to the car or whatever, that the entire transaction or occurrence is being litigated whether you claimed everything or not. In California and in a few other primary states that follow primary rights, in the primary rights states the idea is that uh, you can litigate these primary rights separately. You can litigate the uh, personal injury, the same car accident. You can sue for the personal injury, uh, win or lose, and then come back and sue for personal damage to the car, personal property. This is the P-R-O-P property. Uh, the, uh, you can sue a third time for damage to real property, if real property was involved in the accident, for example, if you the car bounced up on somebody's yard, and, and upon your yard, and uh, damaged the fence or hit the house or something, real property and personality, all of these can be, each of these can be brought in separate lawsuits. Whereas under the federal rules, if you bring any one of them, you're, tra you're litigating the entire transaction or occurrence. <coughs> now, uh, this means that, uh, uh, and so, and they, so that's what Reggie Cotta does. One more thing here regarding the primary right. Please understand that if you sue someone, let's say someone from Texas brings a lawsuit against someone in California and they sue the person in California for a car accident and they sue in the, in the California state courts. So they sue in the California state courts for personal injury only. Let's suppose that this lawsuit was only about personal injury. Uh, uh, in the state courts, personal injury, and let's say it's in state courts. I know this read's a little hard to read. I won't use any more of it. Uh, the uh, so if you're in state court and the person sues for their personal injury the person could later come back in state court and sue for damage to the car in California. Uh, but suppose they go to federal court the second time because they can. They're from Texas and the defendants from California. And let's suppose the damages are more than $75,000. And so suppose this plaintiff from Texas goes to federal court for the second lawsuit. Well, uh, that's okay, because you still have three state law claims remaining. And when you go to a federal court based on diversity and you've got a state claim, you've got three of them here. So all three of these state claims will be uh, litigated. In other words, they'll be viewed as litigated whether you litigated all three of them or not. So the first time that you go to state court, you will treat the uh, whatever is remaining of the transaction or occurrence will be litigated. So you could, this plaintiff from Texas could go to federal court and litigate these other three claims. If the person from Texas had done it the other way around, if the person from Texas had sued in federal court first and just sued for their personal injury, that would be the end of it because everything about the transaction or occurrence would be res judicata. 
Next, we want to talk about collateral estoppel. The uh, the uh, idea of res judicata is that the the claim that the person is bringing, the claim has already been litigated. The cause of action, the cause of action has been litigated, and therefore you can't do it again. But in the case of collateral estoppel, we're not saying the cause of action necessarily has been litigated. We're saying that some parts, some parts of it, some fact has been determined, and you should not be permitted to litigate that fact again. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, I have a automobile accident uh, with you at the uh, street corner. And uh, I have the auto accident uh, at the street corner and uh, the uh, I think we're, uh, we're going to have a horn noise here for a little while. Is it coming through a little bit of that on the mic? Would you please? Yeah, you can hear it. Real bad. Can, it still, can people still hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll talk louder. Uh, the uh, uh, the, the uh, those car horns, those automatic horns, are supposed to go off within two minutes. So I guess we won't be bothered with this for a real long time. The uh, in fact, here's what we're going to do. Uh, it's, it's almost break time. Uh, and so we'll take a 10 minute break right now and then we will pick up 10 minutes from now and hopefully the car horn will not be blowing 10 minutes from now. So let's take our 10 minute break now and we'll come back, we'll talk about collateral estoppel. <laughs>